Okay, well, hello, one and all, and welcome to CS50's very first section. Uh, my name is Carter Zanke, one of the course's preceptors here on campus, and the goal of sections is to help you bridge the gap between lectures and problem sets. So let's say there's something in the lecture that you think you might have understood, but now it's your turn to try to put that idea into practice, actually writing some code along the way. That is the goal of these sections here. So this week's section is on our very first week in CS50, week one. We're moving from scratch into learning this language called C that you use to build increasingly complex programs. So again, my name is Carter Zanke. If you'd like to reach out to me at any time after this section or while you're taking CS50X online, you can reach out to me here at this email, carter at cs50.harvard.edu. But what's on the agenda today? So today we have a few different things from lecture. We have this idea of variables and types, how we store information inside of our programs. We also have an idea of taking input from a user and trying to print some of those values back out to the user as they use our program. Later on, we'll see these ideas of functions and loops and conditionals, allowing us to design ever more complex programs. And finally, towards the end, we'll work a bit on those very first steps in problem set one to help you get started and go on your way to completing that very first problem set. So let's dive in here into our first topic, this one called variables and types. So as we said before, a variable is simply some way of storing information inside of a computer. But I'm curious, for those of you who are here, how would you describe a variable in a single sentence? Let's say we have a contact application. We're trying to store information about, let's say, different people we're in contact with. How would you describe what a variable is in a single sentence? I'm seeing a container, certainly that's a good idea. A variable is a container for some value. It could hold some piece of information, like a number or a character. Any other ideas, too? Containers, something like a group. I think that idea could work. It's something like um, trying to put some piece of data, like a number or a character or even some word, into a particular container, maybe something we could call a group. And often, if I could add on to these idea, is giving it some name. So I see someone else in the chat has said where it's a name given to some value. So often we'll have these containers that will have some values inside of them, and a variable allows us to give that value a name. So visually, you could think of a variable a bit like this. Let's say we have a container represented by this black box here, and inside is some value, like this value zero. But it's not quite a variable yet. Like really, any place in our computer could have some value, but what makes this piece special is that it has some particular name. In this case, if we're building a contacts application, we could say this variable's name is calls. So this variable, this container for some value, now has this name called calls. And calls could store really any particular value. That's why it's a variable. This value could change over time. Maybe I'm calling my sister, for instance, and maybe I'm tracking how many times I've called her. So I've called her currently zero times, but let's say I call her, that value gets updated from zero now to one. Could also be two later on in time, maybe three, or so on. We could think of this variable as a name for a value that can change. In this case, our variable is named calls, and it has this value, first zero, then one, then two, then three, that is changing over time. So this works visually, but there's also some syntax we can use in this new language called C to actually give us this variable, give us this value in memory in our computer. And syntax, as you'll learn, is simply the characters we type to write some C code and tell our computer what to do. So in this case, if we wanted to have this variable called calls, we'd simply write something a bit like this. We'd say int calls equals three and a semicolon at the end. Int calls equals three, followed by a semicolon. And I'm curious, for those of you in the room who maybe have seen this from lecture, what are the three parts you notice inside of this syntax here? What parts do you notice here? I'm seeing uh, a type, some name for the variable, maybe its value, 
And I think we're onto something here. So if we break this down into smaller pieces, this single line of syntax, we'll see there are really three important parts to it. So the first part is the name for the variable. What are we going to call this place in memory that now has this value 3? Well, as we see on the right, we have this container that has the value 3. And up above, it has this name called call. So we can say that when we type int calls equals 3, we're telling our computer that this variable is named calls. Now there's one more piece, also the type, as somebody else said. So here we say, what kind of value does this container store? We've given it a name called calls, but then we have to define, like, what kind of value could I put in this container? Is it going to be maybe a character or an integer, as in a whole number, or something else entirely? That's the type of this variable. And we often define that up front, up first, even before the variable name. And then finally, as somebody else pointed out here, we have the actual value for this variable, in this case, the value 3. Now, there is still one piece of syntax, actually maybe two, we haven't quite talked about yet. We've seen the type, the name of this variable, and the value. But what have we not talked about yet in this syntax? Seeing that equal sign. So this equal sign we haven't yet touched on, but it does have a special name. It's probably less so an equal sign and more so what we'd call an assignment operator. I see some folks saying in the chat too, this is our assignment operator. We're not so much saying that this value, this uh, calls here is equal to three, as much as we're saying we've created some container and called it calls, and we're going to assign the value of that container to be equal to three. So difference between equals and the assignment operator here. And if we wanted to read this in terms of just plain old English, we could do so a bit like this. We could say we're going to create an integer named calls that gets the value three. So now that we've seen this overview of variables, and in this case types as well, I want to ask you a question. Let's say I give you this variable here a variable called country code, and it looks a bit like this on the right. I'm curious, how would you read the code on the left-hand side in plain English? Based on what we saw before, how might you read the code on the left-hand side? What exactly are we doing here? So I'm seeing a few folks saying something a bit like this. So if we had this syntax on the left-hand side, we could read it exactly as follows. We could say we're going to create an integer that is named country code. And that container, that is an integer called country code, that will get the value of 65. And if you're curious here, country code refers to a cell phone number or a regular phone number, where often if you're calling somebody outside of your own home country, you prepend some number. Like for the United States, it's the uh, number 1. For, I believe, Singapore, it is the, uh, uh, the number 65 in this case. So if you wanted to call somebody in Singapore, you'd call them using this country code, 65, and then add their phone number right afterwards. Now, one question we often get is, why do we begin all of these um, statements about variables with this type? Like here we have int. And it's the very first thing we say when we declare or initialize some variable. But why? And I'm curious what, about your idea for this too. Feel free to chime in. Why do you think the very first thing we write is the type of this variable? Why do we even care about types? Why do we even have them in this case? Give you a minute to think here. Why do we care about types? So I'm seeing a few ideas. So someone says that it will determine what we can make the variable do or what aspect it possesses. I like that idea. So certainly we can do some things with numbers, like add them up, for instance, that we couldn't do with characters. Um, someone else says it tells us how to handle that value in memory. That's also a good idea. So you could think of perhaps maybe different numbers and characters are represented differently underneath the hood inside of our computer. As we saw in lecture, for instance, uh, the letter A corresponds to the number 65, which in uh, binary is something like, well, I don't know the exact binary, but it, is, it represents something. It tells us how to represent that character in memory. 
other ideas here too. Um, to reserve enough space to store that data type, that's also a good idea as well. So why don't we give a, a bit of a concrete example as to why we really care about these types. So here, I'm trying to store this value, 65, as part of this variable called country code. But as we just discussed, everything in our computer is stored in terms of zeros and ones, these little bits that we can use to represent all kinds of things. And for the decimal number, 65, well, if we wanted to represent that in binary, it would be exactly this, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. This is the binary, what our computer is actually storing to represent that number 65. So underneath the hood, we could kind of see it like this. We have this value, the decimal number 65, and our computer is actually storing what you see underneath, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, and so on. But let's say we actually change the type of this variable from an int instead to what we call a char or a character. And here we're representing not 65, but now the letter A. Anyone else have an idea of why if we change the type from an int to type char or char, we get A instead? Any ideas? So I'm seeing somebody in the chat saying, we learned from lecture this idea of ASCII, the American Standard Code for Information Interchange. And the ASCII folks, they decided that that decimal number 65, when you want to think of that value as instead a character, it represents the letter A. So here, with this code on the left-hand side, I'm saying, let's store that decimal value 65, but treat it as a character. And if we're say we're representing a character, well, I'm not going to get that decimal number anymore. I'm going to get the actual character represented by that decimal number, which in this case is A. As we'll see later on in the course, these decisions about types actually influence how much memory we're going to use and how we actually store the data on our computer underneath the hood. So more on types a bit later. But let's keep going here and let's see what we can do that's more interesting than just focusing on single pieces of variables, like single variables themselves. We could also try to add things up or change variables over time. And there's a few operators you might want to know to be able to actually do that kind of work. So for instance, here are a few of them. We have this variable now called calls and we're setting it to that value four. But let's say later on, I want to add two to that value. I could use this operator here, that plus sign, to say, take calls, add two to it, and reassign it to that container that we called calls. And then later in my program, maybe I could subtract from calls. I could say, well, let's make calls one less than what it currently is. To do that, I could say, let's take calls, subtract one, and then reassign it back to that variable called calls, and so on for multiplication here on that fourth line and division on that fifth line. So multiplication using our star and division using our slash. But there's an even shorter way to do much of this in C, this language we're currently using. There's this thing called syntactic sugar we could use to actually shorten these lines. I could take the very same operators, plus, minus, star, the slash for division here, and I could uh, a, a, a append an equal sign of it like this. I could say calls plus equals two, calls minus equals one, and that is shorthand for saying calls equals calls plus two, or calls, e or calls um, equals calls minus one. Just kind of a way to update that value in place over time. So I'm curious here, if you were to walk through this step by step, what do you think the value of calls would be? We have some code on the left-hand side. Maybe pause the video, take a moment. What would be the value of calls? So I'm seeing five, and I believe that is correct. So we'll start with four here, and we're going to add two. So four plus two is six, minus one is five. Multiply that by two, that's 10. Divide it by two, that's back to being five. So you're correct, calls in this case would be five. Now, here's a different kind of question. Let's say we take a look at this. So again, calls here is five. Let's say we take a look at this next set on the left-hand side. What would be the value of calls now? Here again is our code. 
what would be the value of calls? Now I'm seeing a few options. So I'm seeing 4.5, and I'm seeing 4. And I'll ask you, which one of those do you think is correct, 4 or 4.5? So let's go walk through this step by step. We have calls first being 4. We'll add 1, which makes it 5. Subtract 2, which makes it 3. Multiply that by 3, which is now 9, because 3 times 3 is 9. And divide 9 now by 2. And technically, if you were doing it um, you're on your own head, you might think, well, 9 divided by 2, that's 4.5. But actually, it'll be 4 in the end. And I'm curious, why do you think it will be 4? I'm seeing somebody saying that it's 4 because we're storing an integer. And you're correct. So calls here, up front, we said call is going to be an integer. That is a whole number. And if we take 9 and divide it by 2, we get this decimal number, 4.5, also called a floating point number. But because calls is strictly an integer, it can't store 4.5. So what will happen instead in C, we'll simply do what we call truncating that value. We'll say we have 4.5. There is some decimal value after that decimal point, but we're going to simply get rid of it, not care about it, and take whatever whole number we see up front. So if our calculations yielded 4.1, what would we get? Well, just 4. If we even had 4.8, we'd get simply 4. So to be clear, it's not rounding, but it is truncating, taking off that last bit of the decimal place. So I'm curious now, what questions do we have about variables, about assignment, about updating them over time? Any questions we can take while we're here live? And feel free to write those questions in the chat for those of you who are here. OK. Not seeing too many questions, which maybe is a good sign, but certainly feel free to um, ask, if you're watching this recording, ask a friend, ask online on CSU's communities. Certainly get those questions answered for you. Now, we'll continue here and try to do something a little more interesting with our variables. I think what we'll do is think about how to take input from the user and then print that input back out to the user. So we'll talk about input now and printing. Well, one of the first things you might want to do is get input from your users. If you're running some program, you want them to control how that program is actually working. So there are a few ways, at least in CS50 and in C in general, to get input from your user. Let's say I want to, in this case, get an input from the user that will tell me what should the value of calls be. Well, in CS50, you'll have access to this function called get underscore int. And there's a few pieces here. Get underscore int takes this argument, this input, called calls. In this case, calls colon followed by a space. And you'll see that separated by quotes here. And moreover, that then is, is surrounded by these parentheses that are, uh, tell us this is the input to this function that we're going to call calls. So there's a few things to keep in mind as we start to use these functions to get user input. First, what we're doing right here this is called a function call. So before we assign the value of calls, we're going to run this function and wait for the user to input some value. So get int, this function on the left-hand side, that will first be run before we store that value inside this variable we created called calls. But let's say that the user does give us some value, and they give us the value 4. Well, the whole point of get int is that once it finishes running, it returns to us or gives us back the value the user entered. So let's say they enter this value 4. Well, it's kind of like saying this function runs and gets almost replaced by this value 4, such that in the end, it's almost exactly like writing some code like this. Int calls gets the value 4. How do we get that? By running this function called get int they return to us what the user typed in. So we, it's a way to get user input here, but now we can think about how we can print that back out. And to print things in C, we'll use this function called printf. So here, we have that same line of code, int calls gets the value 4. 
Notice how now calls is storing that value called for. But now on the bottom, we see calls is, well, calls is percent i backslash n comma calls. And that seems a little cryptic. So I'm curious, for those of you who are here, what do you think will actually get printed out if we were to run this line of code? What will we actually see on the screen? So I'm seeing we literally see the text calls is 4, the actual value 4. And to show you here, we'd see this. Calls is, again, that numeric value 4. And this is a, a special property of printf. You might be wondering, well, why is there an f at the end? Turns out that f stands for formatted. So I'm going to print something that will be formatted. And I have on the inside of this string, if you will, calls is percent %i, I will replace that percent %i with the value of this variable called calls. Now the follow-up question is, well, how did I know to put the value of calls in that placeholder, percent %i? Well, what I did is I followed up my text, denoting quotes here, calls is percent %i backslash n with a comma, and I gave another input to printf. This time I said, I want to put in the value of this variable named calls. So whatever follows your text that you give to printf with a, by a comma, whatever variable you include there, the value of that variable will be included inside whatever format code you've included there, or in replacement of that format code itself. So there are a few other format codes you're probably familiar with. A few of them look like this. We have this um, uh, one for integers, percent %i, that we saw earlier one for floats or decimal numbers, percent %f, one for characters, percent %c, and one for strings, actual um, not just single characters but whole collections of text like we saw earlier, that would be percent %s. So you'll see these over time as well. So questions then on types and format codes, which ones we should use in which cases? Right, so seeing uh, none so far here, what we'll do is actually get some practice writing code. So I think this is enough review of lectures so far. And one of our first steps in this week's problem set is to write a program called Hello World. And this is often the first program many people write when they're beginning their computer science journey. In this case, we're going to write a program that simply says Hello World to the user, and of course, perhaps to the world. So I'll go over and I'll open up CS50 Dot dev. So you should see something a bit like this if you were to go to cs50.dev and log in with your GitHub account. No need to follow along exactly like this, but if you're watching the recording, you certainly can. Notice how I have a few different areas in cs50.dev. I have a top area up here that will soon be able to have a file that I can actually edit things in. And down below, I have this place called the terminal. I can kind of interact with this computer that I've loaded up in the cloud. So now connected to some other computer, not my own, I actually write my own code. And where we, CS50, have installed some software for you to actually write C code very easily. So let me try, in this case, to open up a file called hello.c. I'll type code hello.c in my terminal. Let me zoom in a bit so you all can see that. Here I now have code hello.c. I'll hit enter and I'll see this blank file up top called hello.c. So now I actually go ahead and type in some C code. Maybe I want to say hello to the user. What's the first thing I should do? For those of you who watched lecture, what might I need to do at the top of my file? I need to include some stuff that people are saying. So um, in CS50 and actually in C in general, we have this idea of a library or some code somebody else has written for us that we could then use in our own program. And it turns out that somebody else wrote this function called printf, and because they wrote it and included it in this library, we can then actually use that function in our own code without worrying how they made it. We just kind of know that it just works. So to get access to functions like printf, I can type this special piece of syntax up top. I can say, hashtag include stdio 
h and hit enter here. So this is allowing me to include this file called standardio.h, a header file that has printf defined inside of it. And now what's the next step I might need to do here? I have standardio included, but how would I might start off my program as we usually do in C? So I'm seeing we need to make a main function. So by convention in C, we want to make a new program. We we'll always include that entire program inside this function we call main, int main void. And now, here I have, let me fix that formatting here. Um, I have this function called main. Yours might be syntax highlighted. Not quite sure why mine isn't highlighting here, but I'll resolve that a little bit later. So here we have int main void, and we could type in our actual code inside of this function that we are calling main. Now what kind of code could we type to say hello to the user based on what we saw a little earlier? What function should we use? Probably printf, right? So I'll say printf, and then why don't I do this? I'll say hello world. And now if I hit a, a, uh, a, sent a uh, period here to say a sentence, backslash n, I should be able to hopefully run this program down in my terminal. So let me try this. If I want to run, I could try saying dot slash hello and hit enter. But I get this error, no such file or directory. So what did I actually miss in this case? Yeah, so you're saying I forgot to make this file. So as we saw in lecture, there's this idea of taking the source code, that is this C file, and compiling it to machine code, or the zeros and ones a computer actually understands. So to take this C code and convert it to the code a computer understands, we have this special program called make, which is a compiler that simply says, take whatever is in hello.c and convert it for me to an actual program my computer can run. So in my terminal, I will choose to make hello, hit enter, and now nothing seems to happen, but that's actually a good sign. If I type ls to list my files, I'll see hello star, which means this is a file a computer can run. I'll say dot slash hello, hit enter, and now I see hello comma world. So uh, syntax highlighting aside, which you should hopefully see in your own code space, this is how we can actually write our own hello world program. What questions do we have then on these lines of code? I'm seeing a question here. What is the difference between a library and a header file? So that's two pieces of vocabulary we've used here. Um, we often say we're going to include a header file or conversationally include some library. But there's a difference between these two things. So notice how this, stdio.h, that is an actual file we're calling a header file. And in this particular file, we've defined all the functions that are included in this library, like, for example, printf. But in that header file, we haven't actually defined the entirety of the printf function. We've just uh, defined a few particular things, like what inputs printf takes or what outputs it gives to us. Now, the entire library likely has more files than just this header file under which those functions are actually defined, under which they tell us what exactly does printf do. So the library in general, you could think of it as including all kinds of functions, some like printf, but the header file is our way of defining what functions are inside this library to begin with. A great question. So let's keep going and make this a little more advanced. So our next step in problem set zero is to not just say hello to the world, but to say hello to a particular user. So in this case, you want to get input from the user and allow them, in this case, to um, say hello back to themselves. So I'll go back to my program, hello.c, and now I want to get input from the user. So what could I do? Maybe I want to make a variable. And I'll actually ask you all who are here, what kind of variable should I make? If I want to store some text from the user, what type might be good for that? 
I'm seeing a string. A string is a variable that can store a collection of text, not just a single character, but a whole collection of it. So I'll type string here. This is the type. And now what should I name this variable? What might be an appropriate name here? We could just call it name. This is a variable whose name is name because it stores someone's actual name. Kind of confusing, but we'll go with it. String name. And then it gets some value. So I'll use this assignment operator here. What value should it get? I could type just Carter here like this to get my own name. But I want to get the user's name. So what could I do? I'm seeing I could use get string as we saw before. So get string is a function that is included in the CSFD library that allows you to safely get some user input that is a string. And as input inside these parentheses here, get string can take some piece of text itself or a string. So I'll say, um, what is your name? And leave a space so the user can uh, type in their name after that. And now, down below, I should think about what I should update here. I have hello world, but now what should I change this to? Not hello world, but what? Probably a placeholder, right? As I'm seeing some folks say, I want to have a placeholder for this variable we created called name. So I'll say hello, comma, and then a space, percent s. Percent s was our format code, our placeholder for a variable of the type string. And now how could I make sure that the value of name gets included here? I could simply follow this text with a comma, then say the variable name. And now I'll make sure that whatever value is stored by this variable called name, I should be able to have a placeholder for it here in percent s. So now let's try it. I'll do make hello to recompile my program, update it, and turn it back into machine code. I'll hit enter, and I get a fatal error. Let's see. What might be wrong? So there's a few clues here. Use of undeclared identifier string. Did I mean standard in? It's actually not what I meant in this case. But Often, if you'll see, um, you might get some errors saying something is undeclared, undefined in some ways. When that happens, you might want to take a look at which files you're including at the top of your program. And in this case, I told you that getString was included in the CSFD library, but I didn't include it up top. So let me go ahead and include it. I'll say hashtag include and then cs50.h to include that cs50 header file. And just for style's sake, what I'll do is actually move CS50 above standard I.O. just to keep things alphabetized up here. So C comes before S. I'll make sure I have all my header files alphabetized just for style's sake. It would work the other way too, but just to keep things a little cleaner around here. So let me try this. I'll say uh, make hello, hit enter. Nothing seems to happen, which is good. I'll type dot slash hello to run my program, hit enter. I'll see what is your name, and I'll type Carter, and I should see hello, Carter. So all seems to work in this case. Now, what questions do we have on writing our very own hello to you program? Seeing none so far. And now let's move on to something that's a little more advanced. Actually, there's one question here. So why do we put name? after percent %s backslash n. So it's kind of just by convention. The people who wrote printf, who came a little bit before us and made this function, they simply decided that printf would take um, one or more inputs. So here I say uh, hello percent %s backslash n. And if I want to include, if I want to um, take the value of this variable name and put it in this placeholder, I just simply follow up with this first input called hello, comma, percent s, backslash n, and include that variable itself. If you want to get more advanced with this, you actually could. So let's say I want to take a first name and a last name. I actually have two placeholders, hello, percent s, space, percent s. And now if I wanted to include another variable, uh, one, let's say, change this name to first name, and then have one later called last name, Here's how I could use printf. I could now have three inputs separated by commas. The first is the actual string I want to print with the placeholders. The next one is the first variable to replace. 
that is, the value of first name, will go into this first placeholder. And then the second variable, last name, that will go into the second placeholder here. So I'll update my program. I'll say, hello, string first name. What is your first name? And then here I'll say, string last name gets the value of get string, asking what is your last name, and semicolon to finish. So now I'll type make hello, and I'll run dot slash hello. I'll type Carter followed by Zenki, and now I'll see hello Carter Zenki. So some other ways to use printf if you want to actually involve more than one variable in your output. Now, building on this, let's actually continue on, and let's try actually making a more advanced program to store our contact. So I'll go back to my slides, and I'll show you this. We're going to have a program that prints out, uh, that takes in and stores, and then later prints out a user's contact information. And so if you're going to write this program, I want you to include the following three attributes of somebody. Make sure you include, let's say, their name, you can treat it as either first name or first name and last name, their age, and also their phone number. So name, age, and phone number. And I want you to, if you're watching this as a recording, maybe pause the video here and try to write this program yourself, and then come back and we'll write it all together. All right, so if you're back from writing this program, let's go ahead and try to write it all together here. Go back to my code space, and this time I'll get rid of hello.c. I'll X it out up top, and now I'll type code contacts.c to create this new file that is a C program called contacts. And I'll maybe include my initial um, uh, libraries. I'll say include standardio.h, and include, perhaps up top here, cs50.h as well. Now I'll type int main void, what do we do to kick off all of our C programs here. And now I need to get the information from the user. So I'm curious, for those of you who are here live, what should I be doing to actually get the user's name? Well, probably similar to what we did before. I could say string name equals get string, what is your name? Just like this. But now I want to get their age. And I'm curious, what type might be good for getting their age? Maybe an integer. So I could say int age equals get int what is what is your age, just like this. And then finally, down below, I want to get their phone number. But what type might be best for a phone number? I'm seeing a few options here. So one might be an integer, like it is a phone number, so it could just be an integer value but it might be better defined as a string. So the difference here is that if I say int, let's say just number for phone number, get int, um, what is your phone number? Well, that restricts the user to entering only digits. And sometimes you might see phone numbers written with dashes or plus signs for country codes. And if I wanted to include those, well, if I have an int, I actually can't include those. So if I wanted to, be able to have the user type in pluses along with numbers, a string might be good for this. So I'll say instead string number and use get string, what is your phone number? Now the user could include not just numbers like um, you know, seven or one or so on. They could also include parentheses, dashes, plus signs, whatever they need to enter their phone number. And now to print all this out, I'll go back down below and I'll say, let's say, what, why don't we print out um, name followed by their name. And why don't we print out, in this case, um, the age followed by their age using percent %i for our integer here, and then percent %f, uh, uh, printf, and then number followed by percent %s backslash n semicolon. And now I'll be able to include all of these as placeholders, name, age, and number. I'll be able to take the value of name and put it in this placeholder, for instance. So why don't we do this? I'll say make contacts, then dot slash contacts, hit enter. What is my name? Carter. What is my age? 25. And I'll type in a phone number. I'll say plus one. Let's go with 555 dash 
555-5555 for a random phone number here, hit enter, and now I see that same information being printed back out to me. So what questions do we have on this contacts application here? So not seeing any from our live audience, but what we'll do is kind of round out this week's section by focusing now on not just getting input from the user and storing it in variables, but actually writing our pro programs with our very own functions and loops and conditionals. And I think things get a lot more interesting when we get to use other kinds of building blocks here. So let's talk now about, again, functions, loops, and conditionals. And in this week's problem set, you'll see you'll be tasked with making your very own pyramid, like the pyramid that's in Mario, that very old game, and also some somewhat new game coming out very soon, that Mario has to like, go through and fight enemies and go through an entire level by jumping over things like this pyramid that we see on this video here. So there are a few kinds of loops, and one of these loops is called a while loop. A while loop is great for when you want to maybe do something while some condition is true in your program. So as one example of this, let's say I have a while loop that looks a bit like this on the left-hand side. Well, I will tell you right now that the output of this piece of code is going to look a bit like this on the right-hand side. I'll get four hashes on the right-hand side. How did we get here? Let's walk through it kind of step by step using the syntax that we see here. So the very first line of code, int j, gets the value 0. Well, that creates this container in memory called j that has this value called 0. And now, here's where things are a little more interesting. I have this variable, but I want to kind of do something with it. I could make a condition out of it. I could say, I want to do something in my program while it is true that the value of j is less than 4. That is this condition right here. Now, what do I want to do while the value of j is less than 4? Let's say I first want to print this single hashtag down below. So now I've gone and I've said, well, is j less than 0? Or is j less than 4? It is. It's currently 0. So I'll print out a single hash. And then what will I do? I'll then say, let's increase j by 1 using the syntax, uh, plus plus, some syntactic sugar here, to say j is now 1 more than what it previously was. And now, logically, in this loop, I'll go back up to the top and I'll reassess this condition. I'll say, is j still less than 4? And for those of you who are here live, is j still less than 4? I think it is, right? So we'll keep going. We'll go through this loop one more time. I'll say print out another hash. And then I'll increase j by 1. So now, what is j? j is 2. I'll ask again, is j less than 4? It is. So let's do this again. I'll print out a hash. And I'll increase j by 1. And finally, I'll go back at the top, ask, is j less than 4? Well, it still is. It's still 3. I'll do print another hash, add 1. And now, when I go back up to the top to assess this condition, is j less than 4? Well, j is equal to 4. It's not less than 4. So we'll stop doing the code in this loop. And we'll instead print out this special character we saw in lecture, backslash n, that says we'll move to a new line. So that is one way, in this case, to get some set of hashes going along the bottom of, let's say, our pyramid using some kind of while loop. But there's also another way to do this. We could think of it not just in terms of a while loop, but in terms of another tool called a for loop. So a for loop is, um, it can allow you to do very similar things to a while loop, but it's good for when you know the exact number of times you want to iterate. A while loop is great if you're not exactly sure how many times you want to do something, but you know you want to do it while something is true. A for loop is great when you know the exact number of times that you want to actually loop in this case. So we could actually write that very same while loop using code a bit like this on the left-hand side. There's a few components here, though, that we need to break apart. So maybe the first piece here is going to be this part on the left-hand side. Let me actually zoom through this. Let me show you. Oops. Let me come back here. What did I want to show you? Yeah, so let's actually go back to the very beginning of this. 
to go here. Let's look at the very top of this for loop. So for int j equals 0, semicolon, j is less than 4, colon, semicolon, j plus plus. That probably looks familiar from our while loop, right? We had those kind of very same things in our while loop. We first set j to be 0. Our condition was, is j less than 4? And the thing we did each loop was increase j by 1 using j plus plus. So we've taken all those same components, but simply put them at the top of our for loop. And that allows us to simplify our syntax here. So on the inside, we just say what we're going to do for each iteration of this loop, which is print out a single hash. So to visualize this on the right-hand side, let's say our very first thing we do in this for loop is we create a variable called j that gets this value called 0. Then we're going to print out a single hash. We're going to ask that question again. Is j less than 4? Well, it is, so we'll do that thing we said we'd do at the very end of this for loop, j plus plus. Now j becomes 1. We'll go through, print out another hash, and then we'll say, is 1 less than 4? It still is. We'll print another hash and keep going. And now we'll see, is 2 less than 4? Well, it is. So we'll print another hash. j is 3. Now j is 4. Uh, no longer will we be printing out these hashes. That condition, j less than 4, is no longer true. We'll instead print backslash n to finish things off at the bottom. So what questions do we have here on the syntax for while loops and for loops, if any. A good question. Is there any difference between the while loop and the for loop other than the initial condition and the update in the same line in the for loop? Um, any differences? I think the main difference is more syntax. So um, as you see here, they're in a different kind of order as we saw on the while loop. I'm going to go out on a limb and say I think that most things you could do in a while loop, you can also do in a for loop and vice versa. Generally, though, the syntax of a while loop is better suited for you have some condition. You're not sure when it will be true, but you know what that condition is. So you'd include that in the while loop, whereas a for loop is good because you kind of get to actually specify the exact number of times you want something to do that loop over and over again. If that makes sense and answers your question, let me know. If not, I can give you another take on that. Let's see. Um, why is the J++ now outside of those uh, brackets here, these curly braces that you see on the left-hand side? So that's simply the way that the makers of C decided it would be. You might see some very similar syntax across different languages beyond C, also in things like uh, Java and maybe even Python as well. Basically, this allows us to simply make things a little more compact. We're moving that increment, what we do each loop to increase this variable j, we're moving it to the actual definition of the for loop. Nice. OK. So with these kinds of tools, I want to um, pose a question to you, which is let's say we're able to get to a point where we're printing out a single line of hashes. This code here prints out a single line of hashes and moves to that new line. But let's think for a moment, what could I do to get not just a single line of hashes, but maybe even a full square of hashes, having multiple lines now? I have one loop to make a single line. I'm seeing an idea coming up in the chat. Maybe we could use another loop to have more than one line. Like, not just a single line, but maybe multiple, like four lines of four hashes to make a square of hashes. And it's actually true. You can take a loop like this and put it inside of another loop, a bit like this here. So notice how the inner loop, this 4 int j equals 0, j is less than 4, j plus plus, that is still printing out a single line of hashes. But now I'm going to do that step four times per the for loop that is around that loop. 4 int i equals 0, i is less than 4, i plus plus. The result of this will be this square pyramid, the square um, we see on the right-hand side of hashes. So as you're working on a program like Mario, don't be afraid to make a loop and then put that loop inside of perhaps another loop to help you solve the problem you're trying to solve in this case. 
Now, to help us focus even more on um, functions, even beyond loops in particular, let's go ahead and actually try to get, take a first step towards writing that Mario problem that we see in this week's problem set. And in this case, we're going to, uh, well, actually, in the problems that you're asked to write a right aligned pyramid. In this case, though, we'll actually write a left-aligned pyramid. So if you think of your right hand and your left hand and thinking which way should the pyramid go, a right-aligned pyramid kind of goes up to your right, whereas a left-aligned pyramid goes up to your left. And I would probably argue a left-aligned pyramid is a bit easier than a right-aligned pyramid, but I'll leave that part up to you as you work on the problem set. And today we'll focus on our left-aligned pyramid. So a left-aligned pyramid looks a bit like this. Whoops, looks a bit, um, oh, sorry, I didn't have those slides in this, um, this presentation. That's OK. We will do instead talking about functions and what we could do to create a left aligned pyramid. If you can visualize in your head, let me go to my actual code space over here, what that looks like. I'll say code pyramid.txt. I'll show you an example. So here, this is an example of a left aligned pyramid. This is a pyramid of height 5. But if I wanted to have a pyramid of height 4, I could simply get rid of a hash here, and a hash there, and a hash there, and a hash there. And now I have a pyramid of height 4. And a pyramid of height 3, too, I could say get rid of this hash, and this hash, and this hash, and this hash. And now I have a pyramid of height 3. I keep going, a pyramid of height 2, and even a pyramid of height 1, just to help you visualize what's at stake in this problem here. So if we want to make our very own pyramid, our program that prints our very own pyramid, why don't we go ahead and make a, uh, a file called Mario. I'll say code Mario.c. And inside, I'll do the usual things. I'll include standard io.h. I'll include cs50.h, these header files that have the cs50 library and standard io library somewhat defined in them. I'll then say int main void to kick off this program. And on the inside, what's the first thing I should do? I probably want to get height from the user. But how could I do that, for those of you who are here live? How could I get a height from the user to print out this pyramid? So I'm seeing maybe I want to use something like an integer to store the height, because again, this pyramid will be some number of blocks tall. So I, I like the idea. Let's go with that. I'll say int height here. And I could, for instance, say int height equals 5 off the bat. But I could probably get the input from the user using that function we saw earlier, get int, like this. And I'll prompt the user for some height. So now it's a good idea, once I'm at some stopping point in my program, to try to compile it and see if it works. I'll then type make Mario. Hit Enter, and I'll type dot slash Mario. I'll see I'm prompted for a height. I'll hit 5 here, and nothing happens. But at least I know my program tends to work at this particular stage. So let's think about how we could use functions to be solving this problem. Now, here we have this function called getInt. But it's worth actually diving into what getInt is doing for us and talking through some vocabulary that can help us understand what getInt is actually doing. So for that, we'll focus on functions. And notice here how we can actually define getInt. We at CS50 defined this function for you. You don't see its definition in your actual code because you can only just use it now. Um, but we did work on defining this function for you. And notice a few pieces of this function. Notice how up front we have this idea of the name for this function, this one called getInt. We could think of it kind of like that black box we saw David mention in lecture. We have some um, algorithm, some function, that is called getInt, some black box here that's going to take an input and give us some output. Now we can also define the output of getInt. We, CCD did this part for you. We said that it will take an input, in this case, called prompt that is of type string. So notice how when I used get int, I typed in a string as the input to get int. This input was called height followed by a colon. So now in this case, we see that get int takes a string that within that function is called prompt. And then what does get int give us? Well, at the very end of the day, it gives us back an integer 
in this case, a whole number that the user actually typed in themselves. And so of course, we would use this function a bit like this. We could say, take in a prompt to give us back two or four or so on. But we'd use it using int height gets the value of something like this function, get int followed by height. And when this function runs, it returns to us what we said would return over here, something of type integer. That makes sense. So questions then on this function declaration, what we did over here to define what get int is doing for us. Okay, not seeing too many questions here. So why don't we keep working on our Mario program? I'll go back over here. And we saw before that I could print out a single row of hashes using a for loop, right? But maybe it would be worthwhile to consider how I could put that code that prints out a single line of hashes into its own separate function that I could use in my main part of my program, this one called main up here. So I wanted to define that, um, that uh, code that writes that line of hashes for me separately. I could probably put it in its own function. And to define my own function, I could probably go down below here and say something like this. Why don't I create this new function? I'll call it, um, in this case, print row. And what kind of input do you think print row should take? ideally. Maybe I want to modify the length of the row. How could I say print row takes an input to modify the length? Any ideas in the chat? One thing I could do is think, well, the input to this function, I want it to be the number of hashes to print on the row. So that seems to be a number, an integer. So I could say print row takes an input called that is of type integer, and I have to give it a name. I'll call it, in this case, length, the length of that row. And now I'll think, what should print row return to me? Well, it doesn't really return me a value if I'm going to use it. It simply just prints things out to the screen. In lecture, we saw a difference between return values and side effects. In this case, it just has a side effect. It just prints things to the screen. So I'll actually make sure that this return value is simply void. It's nothing in particular. So now, print row is a separate function. It has an input called length that is of type int, and it returns to me nothing in particular. It just prints things out to the screen. So now, inside of print row, I could have that very same loop we saw earlier, perhaps a for loop. I'll say for int i is 0, and i is less than, i is less than what? Like we, before we saw 4 to get a length of 4, or 3 to get a length of 3, but now I want it to be a variable length. I could decide later what I want the length to be. I'm seeing some folks saying, maybe I could use this variable that's input to print row called length. I'll try that. i is less than length i++. So now, when I use this function print row, I could uh, pass in some number, and then I'll loop that many times in my for loop. And what will I do for each loop? Well, I'll print out, in this case, I will print out a hash each time. At the end of all that looping, I'll print out simply backslash n to move to a new line. So this is my print row function down below. Now if I go up top, I could try to use print row. I could say, well, I want to print a row that has the length of 4, like this. So I'll first get the input of height from the user, and I'll not use it for now. I'll just use print row with the value 4. I'll go to my uh, terminal here, type make Mario, hit enter, and I seem to be getting an error. What is the error? You'll see here, implicit declaration of function print row is invalid in C99. What ideas does that bring up for you here? What am I going to be doing wrong? Yeah, so it seems to me I haven't actually included what we're calling the prototype for this function. So if I look down below here, actually, if I forget my program top to bottom, like C would, I'll see I'm going to include some files, have a main function, get the height, and then call this function or use this function called print row. 
give it the value 4. But up until now, if I'm reading top to bottom, I actually haven't seen the definition for print row. Where is it? Well, it's below. It's down here on line 10. But I can't be calling this function if I haven't told C that it's going to come up in my program yet. So what I should do instead is take the function prototype, that is, its name, its input, and its return value, and put it at the top of my program, often by convention, below my includes. And I'll follow it with a semicolon here, saying this is my function prototype. This is the line of code that tells C, I promise I'm going to define for you what print row is later. But for now, just let me use it when I say I'm going to use it. So now, in main, I'll see, hopefully, C doesn't actually complain when I use print row, because up top I told it exactly what I'm going to use as well. So now I'll type make Mario, hit Enter, and that seems to work. So now I'll type dot slash Mario, hit Enter, say the height is 6, hit Enter, and I get this, uh, this line of only four hashes. But what could I do to update this program to print out not just four hashes, but the same number that the user typed in? Probably want to modify this piece here. But how could I modify it? Yeah, I'm seeing some ideas. I could probably use this variable called height. So we know that this variable called height is a container for the number I typed in, in this case, 6. So if I want to pass in that same value to print row, for it to print out a um, row of that length, I could instead say print row, parentheses, height, and save that. Now I'll type make Mario dot slash Mario, and type in a height of 5, now I get, in this case, 5 hashes down below. And notice in particular that in this case, the name of the variable that I am what we call passing into or inputting to this function print row, that is not the same as the variable I said I would get down below, this integer called length. What actually happens is height. Um, we have uh, storing a value, in this case 5 down below. That value for height is given to print row. And as long as I'm running the code in print row, that value 4 will be associated with this name, length in this case. So I took the value that height stored, 5. I gave it to print row. And as long as print row is running, that value 5 is now called length in the context of this function, print row. We call that this idea of scope in computer science. So here we have a way to take the user's height and a way to print a row of that height. We're not quite all the way there yet, but what questions do we have on the code so far? I'm seeing a question here. Is there any situation where not prototyping, but declaring the function above main would be better? So notice here we had the prototype for print row above main, but we had the definition for print row below it. Now, I think the question is asking, is it ever useful to do essentially this, to copy and paste, to cut and paste this, and put it above main, a bit like this? Um, you certainly could, but I find it more readable in this case to have the main um, function up first, because when we run our program, the main function will always be the first to run. So more, um, more style for style's sake than anything else in this case. Um, question here, in line 4 and 12, you have declared void print row int length two times. Why is that OK? Because we can't do that with variables. That's, that's actually a good observation. So um, if I were to, for instance, on line 8, create a variable called height, and then later on create a new variable called height, like this, I would find that C, when I try to compile my program, doesn't like that. I can only have one variable under one name at the same time. I can't have two variables with the same name. Here, though, it seems like I have two functions with the same name. I have one called print row up here and print row down below. I think the answer to this is that it's a um, uh, built into C is this syntax that if you have a function you want to use and it's defined later in your code, you simply copy and paste the prototype, its name, its input, its output, 
put at the top of your file, and C knows this is a function that will later be defined. It's on a separate function with the same name. And one more question here. Why is height printing length when logically height is up and down and not left to right? That's a great question. We're going to fix that in just a moment. So here, we noticed that in my separate file, I'm going to make um, code pyramid.txt. If I wanted a pyramid of height, let's say, 3, notice how the bottom row has length 3 in this case. So a pyramid of height 3, the bottommost row, that has the length of 3. But also notice how above, this has length 2 and then length 1 up top. So there's probably an association between the height and the actual length of these rows I'm printing. So what if we tried something a bit like this? I know I want to print more than one row, and I probably want to do it in a way that it involves a loop. We saw a loop as a way to do things more than once. So I could say uh, maybe something like um, 4 int i equals 0, i is less than well, how many rows should I print in this case? If I have a pyramid of height 3, how many rows should I print? Seems like 3. So I think in this case, it's safe to loop height number of times and increase i by 1 every time we go. So now, inside this loop, I'll print row. And maybe I'll keep it the same with this input called height. So let's try that. I'll say make Mario dot slash Mario height of 3. I'm going to square. So it seems like we're getting there, but I need to change something about this program. What should I change, do you think? Hmm. So I'm seeing a few ideas. One is actually to use this variable here, i, that we declared and initialized inside of our for loop. So as long as we are within this for loop, within its curly braces, I actually have access to this variable i. i is what's called in scope. I could use it throughout this portion of my code. So maybe I don't want to print a row that is of length height, but maybe of length i. So first, i would be 0 and then it would be 1, and then it would be 2, and so on. So actually, if I look at my pyramid, my very first row is 1, then 2, then 3. So maybe I don't want to first print out 0. I want to print out 1. But how could I change this to not print out 0 first, but 1? Any ideas? I'm seeing maybe I could just add 1 as we go. So that's actually a good idea. Why don't I say? First, i is 0, but when i is 0, I want to print out 1 hash. So I'll say, just take i and increase it by 1. Well, next, i will be 1 after um, going through this loop. Then I'll say, well, how many hashes do I want to print? Well, just one more than what i currently is. So I'll maybe say, that's print out a row of length i plus 1 again. And then i will be 2. I want three hashes, so I'll just say i plus 1 again. And so maybe this should work. So I'll say, uh, make Mario, and then dot slash Mario, pyramid of height 3. And now I seem to be getting somewhere. So I'll make my terminal bigger. I'll say, make Mario, dot slash Mario again, height of 5. And I seem to be getting what I'm looking for with this left-aligned pyramid. So let me ask, what questions do we have on this implementation of Mario using left aligned pyramids and functions in general. All right, so seeing none here. And um, again, the goal for these sections is to give you some tools with which you can go off and solve this week's problem set. And now, one more tool I'll give to you is to think about how you could use the same idea of defining a function to actually work in your favor on this next Mario problem that asks you to write not a left-aligned pyramid, but a right-aligned pyramid. So we saw um, just now we created some function looked a bit like this called print row. In this case, it takes an input called bricks. We called it length. Same thing. Here, we're able to take a length of um, 
uh, hashes to print, and then just print that out as we go. But now, you could consider expanding that function's capability to take not just one input, but two. Maybe one for some number of spaces before the actual bricks or hashes come up, and then one that takes in the number of bricks to actually um, print out those hashes as you go. So notice how over here in pyramid.txt, if I want this to be right aligned, I first print out some number of hashes or some number of spaces, and then my hashes as we go to move this pyramid from being left aligned to now being right aligned. So we'll leave you with that to consider as you solve Mario this week. But that was section one here for CS50. We hope to see you in future weeks. Thank you all for joining, and see you next time.